Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our Understanding Health Talks. Um, and today we're going to be talking about understanding little ears um, with Stephen Frampton, a consultant ENT surgeon. So we're very lucky to have him. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. And thank you all those attending as well. Um, ears are obviously a big issue, as all of us as parents and grandparents know. Um, we've obviously suffered alongside our, our children and our grandchildren when they've had issues with their ears. So I think this will be a really interesting topic of conversation um, and one that all of us can have sympath sympathies with. Um, just a few things to note before I start, we start the talk. Um, this is recorded so that we can watch it. You can watch it and, and, and share it amongst friends, etc. Afterwards, this will be on our in our library on the UHD website. So please do if you miss anything or you want to hear any more information, you're very welcome to come back in again. Uh, there will be questions. Um, there's a there's an opportunity you can type in questions in the Q&A panel. So please do type any questions in there. Um, also, just to sort of remind you, this is very much a public forum and it's not a private consultation. So please do try and keep your patients nice and general, uh, 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 your questions uh, nice and general, and we can go from there. Um, but before we hear from um, uh, Stephen, uh, a great opportunity to hear from Sandy Wilson, one of our public governors, about um, the membership of our trust. Um, and one of the highlights of being a member of our trust is you'll hear about talks like this. So. Um, over to you, please, Sandy. Hello, my name is Sandy Wilson and I'm a public governor of University Hospitals Dorset Foundation Trust. The area I represent is Christchurch, East Dorset and the rest of England. I'm also chair of the Membership and Engagement Committee. As a member, you will have received an email telling you about this Understanding Health talk. Those of you who aren't members, might be saying, well, what is membership? Um, as a member, we one of the benefits is that we keep you informed of what's going on. It's been very turbulent times and the trust is working very hard to remove its backlog of elective surgery, to improve services and to look to the future. We also have the wonderful benefit of the builds that are going on at all of our three sites, um, which will improve the services uh, that are available to our community going forward. We also occasionally ask our membership to provide input into some of the decision making processes, which is very important. And finally, of course, as a member, you will get advance notice of these wonderful understanding health talks, which are delivered by our consultants who are leaders in their field. So why not click on the link in your chat bar that will give you some more information and sign up today. Thank you very much for listening to me and enjoy your talk. Brilliant, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, our members are a huge, huge, huge part of the trust, so um, very lucky to have them and obviously very lucky to have our fantastic governors um, 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 helping with, with, with all the membership. So. Um, without further ado, I now hand over to um, Stephen to give us his talk on understanding little ears. And just to remind you, there is an opportunity. Please do post any questions and, and we'll run through the questions at the end. Thank you very much, Stephen. Many thanks and uh, thank you obviously to uh, the uh, conveners on the talk uh, today for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you all, obviously also to yourselves for uh, taking the time out of uh, busy days and busy other commitments to uh, come and listen. And if you're watching this on catch up, then thank you for, for taking the time. So uh, my name is Steve Frampton. I'm a consultant uh, ear, nose and throat surgeon at University Hospitals Dorset um, and my practice specialises in uh, paediatric ENT uh, as well as a general adult practice. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at children's ears amongst other things. So the remit of the talk today was to provide some oversight as to how ears work, what glue ear is, and an oversight of how it is managed both in the community and in secondary care, so in hospitals. We also wanted to talk about recurrent ear infections that can overlap with glue ear and what specific management for children with recurrent ear infections. 
So how does ears work? So uh, this is a, a pencil diagram of mine uh, that uh, is effectively a cross section uh, taken like a cheese slice through the head. Um, so if you imagine a cheese slice between ears left and right, you see the cross section of the ear here with the pinna or the auricle uh, on the on the left side of the picture. The ear canal going to the ear drum, which is connected to the bones of hearing called the ossicles. And at school, you'd probably remember being termed to those as the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup. Um, but we call those the malleus, the incus and the stapes. Um, and then through to the inner ear, which is the cochlea, which connects to some uh, uh, additional parts that are responsible for balance and uh, nerves there connect then off to the brain. So broadly speaking, this is termed the outer ear, the middle ear, and then the inner ear. And we can see that sound gets funneled in from the pinna. It's the shape it is because it acts like a big cone that helps to receive sound and uh, re receive directional information from sound. Funnel that into the ear canal, gets transmitted down the ear canal. The eardrum then vibrates. And there is an amplification system that occurs due to the ratio of the size of the eardrum versus um, the size of the stirrup in contact with the cochlea and also the mechanical movements of the bones of hearing um, and that amplification helps to enable us to hear sound more easily. Now we currently highly have some uh, screening programs in place for children to check that they can hear well because obviously a very small babies and children can't talk they can't tell you that they can't hear things as well um, and often detecting causes of hearing loss earlier enables us to uh, help work out why those hearing losses are happening and put measures in place to prevent or minimise long term uh, implications. So in this country, we have what's called the Newborn Hearing Screening Programme or NHSP, uh, which has been in place now for approaching 20 years and means that all children when they're born uh, are screened for um, significant hearing loss and the slightly different protocols as to whether your child has been in a neonatal intensive care unit or has not had complications such as that after birth. We then have a second tier of screening which typically happens around the age of school entry um, and is performed uh, normally at school as a school entry hearing test but of course the world as it has been recently with COVID the, there may have been some local disruption you've experienced to those things happening and they may have been delayed but globally they, that process those processes are normally in place to help screen uh, children and for us to check that all our children are hearing uh, appropriately. It is important to note that the newborn hearing screening test particularly um, providing you're down the arm that is um, uh, is not for children in the neonatal intensive care unit it is a very limited test. It's only testing um, predominantly at one pitch frequency. So if you do have concerns about your child's hearing, it can still be worth raising those to medical professionals, even if they've had a normal hearing screening test earlier in life. And of course, some problems develop after that, that uh, screening was done. And so if you have concerns, bring it to the attention of uh, your medical practitioners, your GPs, who can refer you on to uh, audiology for assessment if required. So one of the conditions we're going to particularly talk about today is glue ear. Now, the other term you may hear for glue ear is something called otitis media with effusion. And this is towards the end of a spectrum of pressure problems in the ear of which eustachian tube dysfunction, another uh, long medical term, is, um, is, 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 is a, another condition along that spectrum. So essentially, these conditions refer to problems of the middle ear. So that is the uh, bony box behind the eardrum in the pathway in which the bones of hearing sit. Now, this space, this, this box is normally just filled with air. And it's important that the uh, pressure of the air within that box is very similar to the air in the ear canal. 
And when that pressure is very similar, that means the eardrum can freely move and it can therefore uh, relay sound vibrations from the ear canal through to the bones of hearing and onwards through the um, uh, conduction mechanisms to the nerves to the brain. So to enable that pressure to remain uh, equal across the uh, eardrum and for that box behind the eardrum to have the same pressure as the outside world, a tube exists which it runs down to the back of the throat and this is called the eustachian tube. And you'll have no doubt uh, most of you uh, experienced either on flights or, or going up and down lifts in tall buildings or on car journeys over steep uh, hills that you sometimes when you swallow you feel a click inside your ear and suddenly the sound can change and that's because that tube has opened and allowed the air pressure to equalize uh, when it wasn't equal before. Right as a cross section a little bit further forward, so now heading to the back of the throat, and you can see that that tube that runs to the ear connects to the back of the throat. And it lies at the back of the nose, just above the area of the back of the throat that you would see if you looked in your mouth in the mirror. There are some muscles that connect to the opening of that tube that uh, we activate when we swallow, and that's why swallowing equalizes the pressure on on uh, on on uh, uh, flights and aircraft journeys you'll also note that uh, in this diagram there's a triangle and that kind of represents the space we see when we look through the nose from front to back and the red tissue that i've marked on there is where something called the adenoids sit people are, often know what the tonsils are and, and what they look like because they can see those in the throat in the mirror and they're often uh, a little bit mystified as to what the adenoids are. These are this is essentially tissue that functions very similar to the tonsil tissue, looks very similar to tonsil tissue and sits at the very back of the nose between the opening of these tubes that connect to the ear. So what happens when this tube doesn't work properly, which is the main issue for young children with eustachian tube dysfunction and glue ear. So when this tube doesn't open properly, the uh, uh, air in the box becomes a bit stagnant behind the eardrum and we feel that what probably happens is that oxygen is absorbed the pressure becomes more negative, the eardrum gets more sucked in, and this eventually results in fluid seeping out of the tissue lining the box and that that part behind the eardrum filling up with fluid. And over time, that fluid can become more and more thick and gloopy, and that generates the, the, the um, sort of catchphrase or common parlance of a glue ear, because in, the, in its worst extremity, it really can look quite thick and, and glue-like. The trouble is once you have that fluid behind the eardrum, it really acts as a damping mechanism which prevents the eardrum vibrating well and therefore sound doesn't get transferred as well and people find it harder to hear. And because of the shape of the uh, tube in children, because their facial structures haven't yet developed fully, the opening of these this tube doesn't function exactly as it would as to when they're a bit older. So it's a kind of a, a maturity issue um, uh, for the anatomy. It hasn't yet grown into what it will fully be when they're older. In addition, we know that children get lots of snotty noses, uh, what we call upper respiratory tract infections or urtes, and the inflammation of the back of the nose and the adenoidal tissue causes additional inflammation around the opening of these tubes and which can also prevent air from escaping in and out of them as easily and equalising air pressure. Certainly in some children, nasal allergy is a significant uh, contributory factor uh, and children that uh, certainly sneeze or itch their nose on a daily basis, it would certainly be worth them being investigated as to whether there's any ongoing nasal allergy that's contributing to the pressure problems. We know that various other factors in epidemiological studies are important for uh, the development of glue ear and these include things like bottle feeding, uh, which uh, is higher risk compared to breastfeeding for your children going on to develop glue ear. 
uh, attendance at uh, nursery settings where there's lots of children uh, present rather than being looked after uh, one to one with family at home. Uh, exposure to uh, smoke, um, uh, either in, in or without or outside the family home and a family history. So other uh, siblings, other children in the family or parents that have had problems with glue ear um, certainly increases your chance of uh, having it as well. And there are certain conditions that we know are even more likely to suffer from problems with uh, middle ear pressures, uh, children with Down syndrome, uh, problems with how their palate is formed, so cleft palate or other structural abnormalities and developmental problems of the face, such as craniofacial syndromes. So how do you know that your child has uh, uh, ear pressure problems? And sometimes some of these changes can be quite subtle. Uh, children will often experience a degree of discomfort um, and you may see that they are showing what we call ear tugging behaviour, say pulling or rubbing at their ears because of the discomfort they're experiencing. Typically, unlike active ear infections that will be continuous and, and cause pain for many hours or days at a time, the ear discomfort is generally more short lived, um, can be 10 or 15 minutes up to sort of an hour. Um, and you, the difficulty is you, you, you often will may consider giving your child some uh, pain relief and you're not sure whether the pain relief has made it better or just it's naturally gone away uh, with time. When children are suffering from ear pressure problems and earache, it can change their behaviour. They can be more grisly, they can be more uh, gripey um, and sometimes it can be uh, mistaken for a child being naughty. Uh, as children get older, they may be able to describe a popping or clicking sensation in the ear. And certainly children that have problems with middle ear pressure have an increased tendency to recurrent middle ear infections. So you may find that you're taking the child uh, to the doctor more because they're having episodes of fever with, with pain in their ears and visible changes in the ear when the doctor looks in the ear. Occasionally they may also have ear discharge if that eardrum perforates. I think the thing to note about children with pressure problems in their ear is they don't always have hearing loss. It is a spectrum um, and children with uh, mild eustachian tube dysfunction or even early glue ear may not have significant hearing loss. Um, and so uh, the presence or absence of hearing loss doesn't necessarily determine whether or not the child's uh, uh, got some degree of ear pressure problems or ear discomfort. So when should we worry about our child's hearing? Well, I think the first thing to emphasise is that glue ear is extremely common. To put it into context, 20% of uh, preschool or nursery children will have glue ear at any point in time. So that's one in five children. And 80% of children will have experienced glue ear for a period of time before they get to the age of 10. So it's almost universal. But the thing is that most children will uh, improve and their ear pressures will normalise with time. So typically they'll experience an upper respiratory tract infection, a cough or a cold. They'll develop their middle ear pressure problems and it will often take uh, several weeks, occasionally months, uh, for the ear pressure to renormalise and settle down. We can see on this graph here that there is a what we call bimodal distribution. So there are two uh, peak ages at which children tend to suffer more with glue ear. Uh, those are at roughly two years and roughly five years of age. And two year olds have a chance of about 40% having an episode of significant glue ear during that year and children at five years about 20%. So we can see it's a very common problem. But if your child is showing signs of persistent poor hearing behaviour, and my feeling for a ballpark on that is around six to eight weeks and things still aren't getting better, I would suggest it's worth making an appointment to see your GP at that point for the child to be assessed. It's worth looking out for whether they're making any uh, recurrent errors with their speech pronunciation. Glue ear particularly tends to affect lower, the transmission of lower frequency sounds and letters such as M, B, D, 
are often misheard and mis, uh, uh, mispronounced as a result. Um, and so uh, being particularly mindful and reporting any speech issues is, is helpful to clarify whether there's an underlying hearing problem. It's definitely worth speaking to the other caregivers. Um, nursery or school will have noticed potential inattention or a drop off in uh, educational performance, and that can be a, a sign that um, you know, there's a significant uh, hearing impact. So what can you then do about things? Well, as I say, speaking to speaking to the school or the nursery in the first instance is really important because what you want to do is to um, optimise the child's access to sound wherever possible. And there are certain environmental changes uh, that can be uh, considered that will enable them to hear better despite their uh, inherent uh, hearing difficulty. So that might be something as simple as uh, moving the child towards the front of the classroom so they're closer to the teacher, encouraging a, a, um, uh, an environment where background noise at school is, is minimised, and, and, and some things, uh, some adaptations to teaching style. So for example, ensuring that you're always facing the class when talking rather than uh, turning towards another projector or on other teaching device. And if, if, if uh, teachers are, are made aware of these, then they can modify how they're delivering their class uh, to ensure that uh, they're, they're being clear to their, um, uh, their, their students. Um, and can also uh, ensure that uh, uh, by direct questioning whether uh, children have heard what's been said. There may also be some role in changing the, uh, the fabric of the school and if there's ongoing issues, um, they may be able to look at whether uh, some of the environmental changes can be changed, such as um, carpeting uh, rooms, uh, having curtains uh, in the rooms rather than blinds, which can sometimes help reduce uh, acoustic echoes, etc. But obviously all these things come at a cost, but it may be something for them to consider going forward. There are some also some um, uh, assistant uh, uh, listening devices that can be uh, used in schools, um, and that's something else that, be, uh, that can be considered. In the first instance, it's worth um, speaking to whoever is your best point of first point of contact in the school, be it a form tutor um, or, or a particular designated teacher. But if there are any um, uh, difficulties, then um, there should also be uh, a member of the school staff who has uh, been uh, assigned the role of uh, a special ed educational needs coordinator or SENCO. Uh, and they would be a second uh, second line uh, person who can be approached to raise concerns um, and to um, uh, help to optimise the uh, school situation for your child. Now, often we find that speech and language uh, therapists are um, have, have embedded um, uh, roles in schools and if school has concern uh, about uh, children's speech and learning development they often can refer directly to speech and language therapy so uh, again a discussion between you as, as parents or caregivers in the school about um, your child's uh, educational and language development um, can mean that that is uh, a speech and language therapy is uh, referral is considered if appropriate if you've got to that, that period of six or eight weeks and you're still convinced your child is struggling and the school share your concerns, it will be worth making an appointment to see your GP. The one thing I would uh, 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 encourage uh, to stress perhaps is that this does not necessarily mean you'll automatically be referred straight on to secondary care at this stage. And sometimes GPs will monitor the hearing uh, function for a little while before referring straight on. Um, but they can then at, that, at any stage refer on to the audiologist directly for uh, consideration of a hearing assessment or to us as ENT specialists, um, uh, particularly if there's something else, other concerns uh, at the same time in addition to hearing. There's a couple of things that you can think about trying um, at home during this period. As we've discussed, inflammation in the nose and recurrent coughs and colds can be a persistent trigger for developing uh, ear pressure problems. Um, so the use of an over-the-counter saltwater spray in the nose, such as the Sterimar can shown in the top right picture, can be helpful uh, in children just to help 
wash any nasal mucus, nasal secretions out from the back of the nose uh, down into the throat and means that they're causing less uh, irritation and inflammation in the nose and less of a trigger for ongoing problems with the pressure problems at the back of the nose. Uh, some children are extremely tolerant of, of, uh, of the use of a salt water spray. You'd expect that uh, all children will hate it, but actually making it into a bit of a game, uh, uh, playing countdown before pressing the spray, all sorts of other tips and tricks can actually mean that children are quite compliant with it. And strangely, some children obviously feel that the, appreciate the benefit of it and actually quite enjoy it. So um, everyone's different, but uh, don't necessarily automatically assume you won't be able to um, uh, to uh, achieve good success with a saltwater spray in a, a young child. The other thing that can be useful is something called auto inflation devices, and there's a number of these available on the market. Um, the one pictured here is called the Ote Vent, um, but there's others such as the Eustachy and the Ear Popper. And basically, these are devices that um, uh, basically force air up and down the eustachian tube itself, so effectively a form of physiotherapy. And you can buy these over the counter um, from most pharmacies or on some on online retailers. And I've put a link to a, a video in the resources at the end of the section where it demonstrates how these can be used. So as we've, as we've uh, mentioned, once your child is uh, uh, referred on to secondary care, they will have their hearing test uh, performed um, and will often ha then have that repeated after an interval period of time. And typically that will be at least three months. And the reason for having that period of monitoring is that 50% of children with glue ear, their, their, their pressures resolve the, the fluid behind the eardrum uh, resolves within three months, so they wouldn't necessarily need any further intervention beyond that. Um, so you then sieve out the people that definitely need something else done um, if they've continued to have problems with their ear pressures after three months. And what, broadly speaking, are those options? Well, if things are very mild, then watchful waiting may be uh, a continued option. Uh, hearing aids may be an option if the hearing loss is uh, sufficiently uh, marked and if the hearing loss is more than what we call 25 decibels averaged across all of the tone thresholds and there's ongoing evidence of poor hearing behaviour then grommets can be considered. So what, what are grommets or ventilation tubes? Well these are small plastic tubes that are like a little bobbin that is inserted into the eardrum and allows ear pressurization from behind the eardrum to the ear canal. Once inserted, they normally, uh, simple grommets normally stay between six and 12 months and then get forced out of the eardrum by the eardrum itself, which in 99% of, of 100, 99 out of 100 cases or 99% of the time, heals up fully without any residual hole in the eardrum. In roughly a third of cases, pressure problems can come back afterwards and it can be necessary for children to have further sets of grommets inserted. Sometimes you, we think about addressing the adenoids at the same time that grommets are inserted, again to reduce that sump of uh, infection or inflammation at the back of the nose. And occasionally grommets may need to be inserted because the eardrum itself has developed an unhealthy pocket within it, which can cause further problems later on. Looking after grommets afterwards, uh, we tend to often give antibiotic ear drops for a week. Uh, we then suggest ears are kept dry for a couple of weeks for the lining of the, the ear to, to renormalize. But contrary to, pub, to, to, to uh, what many people think, I'm, I'm normally personally very happy for uh, children to swim with grommets in after they've been inserted. The things that are important to avoid are pressure going down the ear canal and through the grommet, so to avoid jumping in from the side of the pool or diving deep below the surface of the water. And I would also recommend avoiding uh, dirty water such as swimming in rivers and, and lakes or soapy water. And the reason for soapy water is that it has a lower surface tension and can more easily slip through the grommet and be irritating to the middle ear. If, however, children do have clear runs of infections associated with water going into their ear and into the grommets. They may need to have that uh, water excluded when they swim and you can buy uh, headbands or ear moulds uh, that can keep water out when children are swimming. 
So once grommets are in place, once the uh, we would normally do a hearing test to check that the hearing had normalized and the problem had been reverted or review the ears to check that any retraction pockets had reversed. The next important thing really is to make sure that the grommets come out uh, appropriately on their own. So um, I'd normally suggest that grommets uh, are ensure that they're extruded by two to three years after they've been inserted and the risk is that the longer they're left after that the more likely it is that a little hole will remain in the eardrum when the grommet does come out. So if you are discharged from ENT care uh, before that period it's important for you to make an appointment with the doctor to check the ears again around about two to three years after the operation to make sure those grommets have come out. Any infections that develop while the grommets are in place are best treated with antibiotic ear drops rather than uh, oral antibiotics in the first instance, and these can be made available by your GP. So an alternative to inserting grommets are hearing aids. And there are some advantages and some disadvantages to these compared to grommets. Obviously, you don't need a general anaesthetic or an operation to have the hearing aid uh, fitted. Um, and it, facilitates access to sound, which is the most important thing when you're managing uh, hearing problems. However, not all children tolerate wearing something on the ear uh, continually. Um, some, some of them unfortunately can be bullied at school. Um, and it's important to note that the hearing loss with glue ear can be fluctuant. So some days it can be better, some days it can be worse, and the hearing aid isn't able to adjust to that fluctuation in hearing, which means that sometimes the hearing aid amplification will not be enough, and sometimes it may be too much causing loudness discomfort. Often you'll need to obviously continue with ongoing testing for hearing aid adjustments, so there will be uh, uh, many appointments required. Um, but it, it is an alternative for children to, to having an operation to insert grommets. So to move on uh, briefly now to recurrent ear infections. There are two forms of recurrent ear infections and they primarily depend on the, the main location of where the infection lies and those are uh, outer infections which affect the uh, ear canal or outer ear so those are called otitis externa or middle ear infections which are the space where the uh, the ossicles hit uh, sit behind the eardrum called middle ear infections or otitis media and sometimes clinically it's hard to differentiate where the actual uh, infection has arisen from, particularly if the um, eardrum ruptures and um, uh, pus from behind the eardrum comes out into the ear canal. So to talk about ear infections that start behind the eardrum or the acute otitis media, there's often an element of underlying eustachian tube dysfunction or glue ear uh, 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 predisposing children to these ear infections. They typically occur after uh, viral infections of the upper respiratory tract, so common coughs or colds. And my experience is they tend to peak between the age of about a year and a half and two and a half years of age and will often subside after that. We know that uh, children that are compliant with having had their um, uh, pneumococcal vaccine um, as part of their standard childhood immunisation schedule uh, have a, a, a less than 75% um, chance compared to others of uh, a, a, of having recurrent middle ear infections. So it's just one of the benefits of um, uh, sticking to the vaccination schedule. Children with acute ear infections often present with fevers. Um, they may be able to uh, show that they've got pain from their ear and they sometimes have discharge coming down their ear canal. Uh, parents that have children that suffer from these infections frequently are just are, are very aware of the poor quality of life that can result, sleepless nights, pain, poor behaviour and obviously particularly as we've experienced during um, COVID uh, where it's, um, nurseries have been obviously reluctant to have children that are unwell that can result in problems with time missed from daycare and parental work. So for any acute ear infection, um, if your child is extremely unwell, so that is they're vomiting, they're lethargic, they're listless, or they have red swelling behind their eardrum or the ears being pushed forward, that's the medical emergency and they, they need to come to hospital for assessment. 
if your child um, has uh, a fever and some discomfort, you uh, may choose to manage that uh, at home uh, if the child is otherwise well, or you may take them to your GP. In many, or urgent treatment centre, uh, in many cases, um, GPs will not prescribe antibiotics in the first instance, and that's particularly if your child's over the age of three months, if they're uh, 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 under the age of, sorry, if they're over the age of, under the age of two, but they've got an infection in both ears, then they might consider giving antibiotics, or if there's discharge coming from the ear, they might consider giving antibiotics straight away. Um, and as I say, under three months, they would as well. Um, but otherwise, they may well decide to give you antibiotics or they may give you what's called a delayed script. So see how you go for the first two or three days. If the child gets better, not antibi antibiotics may be uh, avoided um, and you can cash in the prescription if um, they remain poorly or become more unwell. And the reason for that is that many of these infections are viral rather than bacterial and the antibiotics therefore won't necessarily help. And we know a lot of children will get better on their own without, without antibiotic treatment. So that's the kind of rationale for why, that, why these decisions are made. And the children that we, said we put in that list that definitely need the antibiotics early, it's because they're in slightly higher risk groups for developing complications. If you're having the mild forms of infection and they're occurring less than four times per year or less than uh, two monthly over a six month period, then these are commonly managed what we call expectantly, i.e. let's just see how things go. And in most cases, this is something they grow out of and they settle. If, however, you're getting these infections more than uh, every once every two months, then it's worth referral to ENT for discussion about alternative management strategies. And I think some of these discussions can be some of the hardest ones we have. There are several options here and a lot of uh, the um, uh, decision making comes down to uh, people's uh, and parents and the caregivers and the family as well as the doctors uh, feelings regarding uh, antibiotic use risks of surgery um, and uh, willingness to uh, observe for a period of time so one of the options is what we call prophylactic antibiotics. Um, so these are antibiotics given for a longer period than we would give for a treatment course for an infection with the intention of stopping an infection coming along, breaking the cycle of recurrent infections. Um, and there are various different antibiotics that have been used for this in the past, amoxicillin, trimethoprim or two other ones. Um, but in my practice at the moment and uh, some of my colleagues, um, azithromycin would be my antibiotic of choice. The nice thing about this antibiotic is that uh, you take it once a day uh, for three successive days and then it will have an effect on the upper respiratory uh, tract lining for the next two weeks. Um, so to give you a six week uh, course of uh, preventative cover, you only actually need your child to take nine doses of antibiotics in total. And as children don't tend to uh, always uh, um, uh, like taking their antibiotics, that, that can be a uh, sort of more favourable solution to some of the other antibiotics. And the nice thing about this particular antibiotic is it has both anti-inflammatory and antibiotic um, effects. And it's also very well tolerated. The alternative to uh, prophylactic antibiotics would be uh, considering the insertion of grommets. Now, unfortunately, insertion of grommets is a bit of a, a, a double edged sword. It's not a magic bullet um, and the um, success rates compared to um, being inserted for hearing are much less when it's inserted purely for recurrent ear infections. So there were some uh, uh, studies done that looked at a collection of studies and um, effectively it found that on average it only reduced the child's uh, number of episodes of ear infections per year by roughly one to one and a half episodes per year and that nearly eight percent of children 
would uh, continue to have intermittent ear infections over the next 12 months after the grommets were inserted, and that roughly 4% of children uh, would have an ongoing discharge that didn't settle and might necessitate the grommet being removed. So you can see that those are not necessarily easy decisions, a decision not to treat, to wait and see how things go and see if it's something the child grows out of, to take an antibiotic for a, a period of uh, uh, six weeks. Um, and by that time, parents have often come to uh, come to see you uh, having had many courses of antibiotics and wanting to see you because they've had lots of antibiotics versus the risk of an operation that is not uh, perfect at resolving the symptoms. So we have to have some uh, slightly detailed uh, conversations about that and come to an agreed management plan. And that may be to consider a trial of antibiotics and if things don't settle, consider the surgery afterwards. Just as a slight aside, um, recurrent otitis externa, not primarily the focus of the talk today, but this is infection of the outer ear canal. It's normally in older children, they, one of the discerning features, they tend to get itch before they get pain and blockage rather than pain being the initial feature. And it's often uh, predisposed to by children that have very dry or cracked skin in and around the ear canal. So that may be related to dandruff or eczema. And really one of the focuses of treatment for those needs to be in keeping the skin moisturised uh, and sometimes a short course of steroids, are, uh, steroid creams are helpful uh, uh, with uh, healing any cracked skin and some may find that uh, keeping water out of the ears help helps break the cycle and prevent those outer ear infections. If you catch those uh, infections early then astringent drops rather than antibiotic drops down the ear canal can help to settle the infection um, but if not antibiotic drops from your GP are the, are the, the main mode of treatment and the ear uh, would benefit from having a uh, swab taken and sent to the microbiology lab to see what, what is grown if the initial choice of antibiotic is not effective. So to summarise, middle ear pressure problems in children are extremely common, but frequently self-resolve. Um, if you feel your child is struggling with their hearing, perhaps because of middle ear infections or other problems, it's imperative to inform other caregivers, whether that's the school or the nursery early, so that compensatory mechanisms can be put in place in the classroom to maximise their access to sound. Consider some of the simple things that you can do without a prescription, such as a saltwater spray in the nose or use of an auto inflation device. And they can, the auto inflation device is, um, the auto vent, for example, is licensed over the age of three years. So children still quite small can do it. The one thing I would say about the auto inflation device is don't do it during an active ear infection. Um, that's that would be um, uh, is clarified in the in the instructions that come with the leaflet. But once the active infection has settled, it's safe to do safe to use. See your GP if the hearing problem doesn't improve and do expect that there'll be a period of monitoring uh, rather than immediate intervention because many of uh, these middle ear pressure problems do improve on their own. And just lastly, to reiterate that particularly with recurrent middle ear infections, the choices really aren't easy um, and, uh, and some, compl some, some uh, um, complex and sometimes modifiable decisions need to be made. There's a list here of some useful resources that you may wish to go away and uh, look at uh, after the talk. And thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? I'll unmute, I'll unmute myself, myself now. Uh, thank you very much for that, Stephen. That was fantastic. Very good talk. Uh, we have got some questions that have come in, so I'll just read through a couple, if I may, and then we can go from there. Some of them I think you did answer in your talk, but but it's fantastic. So we have uh, um, uh, how much do childhood ear issues lead to hearing issues in adult life? So I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we do see a um, subset of uh, of adults that have had middle ear pressure problems in younger childhood that don't get better, but the vast majority of children go, grow out of their pressure problems as the eustachian tube matures, as it lengthens, as the muscles work better, and typically 
when children are getting into their late single figure years, um, their uh, ear, middle ear pressure problems have largely resolved, but there is a small subset that go through to adult and have adulthood with continued ear pressurization problems. And they may need um, different treatments. There are some types of grommet that are very, uh, that are, that are longer, long standing tubes that stay, they're designed to stay in the ear for longer. And some ears just become uh, unhappy, but stably unhappy. So uh, the ventilation tubes will no longer provide significant benefit. And then you, uh, as long as the ear remains stable, the main focus for them may be on uh, the use of, of hearing aids and, and amplifying sound. Of course, there's lots of other reasons why we can have problems with our ears that aren't related to middle ear pressures. Um, but uh, hopefully that that I think your question was largely related to pressure problems resolving. Thank you for that. As you might just go to a, a question on pressures. We've all sat next to somebody on a plane. Um, if you're flying with a baby or a small child, how do you help stop any pain from difference in pressure? Is there any advice for that? Because um, um, we all know um, the discomfort that, that young people can face on a plane. So absolutely. Um, the problem tends to be on landing or, or descent rather than ascent. And the reason for that obviously is that flying the higher altitude you go, the pressure is lower. So the pressure in um, uh, your uh, Ear when you come back to ground wants to try and suck ear, uh, suck uh, air back through the eustachian tube. But if that's got a natural tendency to collapse, um, then the the eardrum gets sucked in. St the stretching of the eardrum stretches the nerves and causes the pain symptoms. On the way up, um, because the air that's in your um, middle ear at ground pressure expands, any pressure equalization problem um, is relieved by the air forcing its own way out of the eustachian tube um, so you don't tend to get so much in the problem so much of a problem uh, uh, on the way up it tends to be on the way down so simple um, uh, action of, of, of swallowing um, and hence why they always used to give out the uh, the boiled sweets on flights um, helps to uh, activate the, the palatal muscles at the back of the throat which open the eustachian tube so giving your child depending on what age they are giving them something to uh, eat or drink or if they're old enough to to uh, have something that they can uh, suck on then for them to suck on um, will help the um, uh, um, uh, eustachian tube to open um, you can alternatively um, purchase uh, some devices to use in, in the uh, to put in the ear canal, which prevents the um, uh, uh, pressure altering in the ear canal with uh, height that therefore means you don't get the uh, pressure differential across the eardrum. So if you do go to your local uh, pharmacy, um, you can uh, ask, ask them to give you some more information about the products they have uh, they, they have available in stock for use. Um, older children that are within the age with, with which decongestants are uh, usable, so that's typically over the age of six. Um, you can use uh, a decongestant and take a decongestant uh, with you, and that would be something like Otrevin Junior, but of course there are other brands available, so that's something else you could consider. Fantastic, thank you very much, very good advice. Um, we've had a couple of messages about school hearing tests, uh, just a reminder uh, that you can always ask the school nurse for a hearing test if concerned, which is good advice. Thank you for that, sharing that. Um, a couple of questions on glue ear, if I may just put them, <coughs> group them together. So the first one, is there a way to improve hearing for a child who has glue ear, apart from curing it? I know you ran through some of the things about making sure they're sitting at the front of the class and things like that, but improving hearing. Um, and also there's another question about glue ear. Are there links with glue ear and asthma, hay fever, etc.? Um, so yes, so to take the first question first, it's really it's really a case of uh, the only way of um, bypassing the glue ear, if you like, is is to drain the fluid um, and to get the ear pressure to normalise. Um, 
Otherwise, effectively, what you're trying to do is make the best of a poor hearing situation. Now, that is effectively by increasing the volume of sound that is uh, available to the ear. So that either means by the use of you know, a hearing aid uh, or other assistant listening device that's 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 uh, magnifying the sound that's given to the ear or positioning yourself in the environment that uh, you're closer to the thing that you're trying to pay attention to uh, and, and further away from other background distracting sound and therefore positioning in the class can be can be beneficial. Um, uh, sorry, remind me of the second question again, sorry. Uh, the second question was, apologies, uh, uh, asthma, are there any links uh, with asthma and hay fever? So um, there's been lots of postulated uh, uh, links um, of various uh, problem, very various causes to glue ear, um, and some of them are stronger than others. Um, asthma uh, is uh, can be associated with hay fever and other uh, reactive conditions of the aerodigestive tract. So. Um, if your nose is inflamed, um, your uh, opening to eustachian tubes is, is likely to be uh, inflamed uh, as well. Uh, and we know that children with um, inflamed noses, whether that's because they're allergic to um, uh, uh, pollen such as hay fever, house dust mite, um, pet hair, um, whatever is the cause of the initial trigger, uh, if they're getting the inflammation in their nose, they'll be getting inflammation around the adenoids and the uh, eustachian tube orifice, um, and that can contribute, therefore, to them having middle ear pressure uh, problems. Um, other causes have included things like reflux as well, um, and there's been various studies uh, suggesting that children that have reflux may be more prone to having middle ear pressure problems. Um, but again, the, the you you um, uh, so then, then, then flip to does that change how you manage things? And and obviously, if you've got significant reflux problems, you'd you'd be wanting to 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 look after and manage those because of the reflux problem itself primarily, but it may have an additional knock-on effect to help remove one of those things that's contributing to the glue ear problem. Brilliant, thank you for that. And and one more on glue ear whilst we're here. Um, are there any long-term problems associated with glue ear? Are you likely to have it again in later life? Is it something that, that adults can have as well? So, um, so yes, adults can have it too. I think the, the, the major issue in terms of recurrence of glue ear is more while you're still in childhood. So any child that has glue ear, glue ear and has grommets inserted, as you say in the, in, said in the presentation, has you know, a third chance of having the problem come back when the grommets fall out and each time it still remains a third. So um, there's a diminishing chance that your problem is going to continue for every extra set of grommets you've had. But once you're in a position that you've had three or four sets of grommets, you're already in quite a small uh, minority and it may be that you're one of the unlucky people that continues to have pressure problems that are ongoing. Um, it's more likely if you do have middle ear pressure problems that it's going to continue from childhood into adulthood rather than it resolve in childhood and then come back at some point in in later adulthood and again if you were getting middle ear problems coming on later in life I'd want to be looking at other causes such as nasal allergy such as whether there was anything else going on at the back of the nose that was contributing to your symptoms. Brilliant. And a quick question on, on the grommets. Um, um, and there's a question here. Are aids used in preference to grommets? So. Um, there are certain conditions that would place you at higher uh, risk of having complications or a unfavorable outcome from surgery, i.e. the insertion of grommets. So and one of those conditions, for example, um, would be uh, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome and generally in the UK the recommended uh, management for children with fluid behind the eardrum who have Downs is to use um, to use hearing aids and amplification rather than inserting grommets and that primarily is due to the fact that 
children with Down syndrome have a much higher chance of having persistent discharge that doesn't settle despite the grommets being inserted and that the pressure problems are unlikely to improve uh, after the, the temporary insertion of the grommets and the temporary um, pressure normalisation. And yet you still would have the risks of surgery, particularly in terms of leaving a hole in the eardrum and children with Downs also have quite narrow and uh, anatomically slightly different uh, uh, ear canals. Uh, and overall, those things put together may mean that uh, currently in the UK, certainly um, hearing aids are generally favoured over grommets. Um, there are other conditions that that, um, you know, they would would often Su suggest grommets as part of a pathway of care. So, for example, children with cleft palate, where they're having their palate repaired, they often have uh, glue ear um, and they will often have uh, consideration of grommets inserted early as part of their package of care around their cleft. But but other than that, really, it, it is it is a discussion that I think should be offered to every patient and the an, an open discussion about the uh, the pros and cons um, and my sitting in a surgeon's chair, my perspective tends to be that most people tend to go for grommets rather than hearing aids, but there's there's possibly a whole cohort of children with hearing aids that we don't see get referred to us because they're very happy with their their hearing aids and the audiologists give them a, a very good service and take very good care of them. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, two more questions and then and then we, we must let you get on. Um, um, the next question is, would you recommend the use of Sterimar without first seeing a GP? So um, Sterimar is um, available over the counter to purchase over the counter, so it's not something that has to be um, prescribed. Um, it is literally a sterile salt water, so there's no uh, active uh, medicines in there that can do your child uh, any harm. Um, it's very safe to use and I think the, the only main drawback is if your child uh, doesn't like using it and, and clearly you get to a point trying to use it that you feel they're not going to um, uh, condition to using it, they're not going to get on with it. Um, but really, it's a it's a it's a, a a good method of maintaining good nasal uh, hygiene in a child, particularly around the time of uh, of a, a viral illness when they're snotty, bunged up, etc. And we find um, parents that have children that have lots of problems with snuffliness and congestion at a very early age, either when they're still a baby. Um, very much engaged with the use of salt water drops in the nose, saline drops, um, and sometimes they also use the aspirator bulbs that help to then suck the, the gloopiness out of the nose after it's been softened with the uh, salt water. And this is really just an extension of that, the use of the spray with the, um, uh, the salt water spray. Um, the, the spray mechanism helps to wash the saline more effectively throughout the nasal cavity and give a bit of propulsion so that it's uh, washing the mucus towards the back of the nose and it gets swallowed. Um, so I think for, for the children that are a bit a bit bigger and can tolerate it, then, um, then uh, moving on to a spray rather than using the drops uh, after a child's more than, more than a, a few months old can be beneficial. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sheed. Um, we've got the last question. It's quite a specific question, but I'm hoping you can sort of give a general answer because obviously you won't be able to sort of advise totally on the, on the specifics of the case, but I'm hoping you can give a general answer. Um, and thank you again for everyone who's been posting questions. Uh, so this question, and it's far too small type, so I'm struggling to read it. Uh, uh, but this question is, my daughter is five in July and has mild to moderate hearing loss and uses hearing aids. She'd struggled with glue ear the whole time and in December had her first syringing of her ears. This did work in the short term, but has since reoccurred. At what point would grommets be considered an option in the future? And is this also likely to fall, fail, sorry, fail in someone who wears hearing aids full time? Um, so I think there's a few elements to that question. And obviously, um, uh, so, so one of the issues is clearly that all hearing loss isn't due to pressure problems and glue ear. Um, and it may well be sometimes that uh, significant wax impaction in the ear canal can affect hearing. 
wax in the ear canal is is normal um, we all have it we all uh, develop it it normally pushes itself out of the eardrum with time and actually wax impaction has to be quite severe to completely occlude the ear canal and have any significant effect on hearing um, ear syringing or microsuction is performed to help wash that wax or suck that wax out of the ear canal and if this child has, has, has gained significant benefit from that then it sounds like wax was was contributing um, to the the hearing problem um, one of the slight disadvantages sometimes with hearing aids is that the action of wearing a mold um, in the uh, ear canal so it's like a little plug through which the um, speaker of the hearing aid uh, is seated it it, it can uh, contribute to the wax building up in the ear a little bit, so they're a little bit more prone to that. Um, uh, obviously, if you don't have any wax in your ear canal, ear syringing or ear microsuctioning isn't going to make things any better, and that may be why if there's a, a second attempt when there's nothing to, to see in the ear, things don't get any better. Um, if the problem on the hearing test is shown to be fluid behind the eardrum or a suggestion that that's at least contributing to the problem, then the um, insertion of grommets may benefit. Um, but of course, it's always worth noting that there can be a couple of problems with the hearing. So there can be problems with how the bones of hearing themselves are formed and connected. There can be problems with the inner ear and the nerves that carry the the, um, the the hearing signals to the brain or even the brain itself. So and the things aren't mutually exclusive. So um, that's why the the uh, the audiologists are so uh, valuable in their assessment of the hearing to help ascertain how big the hearing loss is, but also what is causing the hearing loss. Um, and we can always we sometimes even insert grommets on the uh, on the intention for it to help clarify whether glue ear is all of, of the problem or whether there's another uh, problem contributing to how sound isn't getting through the the system very well particularly when that's what we call um, a conductive deficit so other problems in the sound getting to the inner ear so particularly with the bones of hearing and the only other ways of finding out those problems are either doing a more extensive operation or or, or ct scanning and, and other things so sometimes putting a, a grommet in can be a good diagnostic uh, test to understand more about what's causing the problem with hearing so for this particular person where they've said they've had good improvement with uh, hearing aids over time that's fantastic would grommets be an alternative option for them if there was suggestion on the hearing test that there was at least an element of, flu of, of fluid behind the eardrum and glue ear with a conductive hearing loss then yes potentially but we wouldn't be able to guarantee that putting the grommets in um, would would it certainly doesn't reverse all um, uh, causes of, of, uh, of hearing loss that are downstream of the inner ear. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that brilliant answer, Stephen. Um, and I've just got really three thank yous to say to finish us off. Um, um, thank you all for coming, uh, for attending and for sending us some great questions. Really appreciated. Um, it's brilliant that, that you do sort of engage with these talks. So and just a reminder that this talk will be available on our website afterwards in our library. Um, so please do come and listen again to Stephen, um, but also do share with friends, family, relatives who might be interested in this, because I think, it, as I said at the beginning, it's something that will affect us all in one way, shape or another. Um, also, I'd like to say thank you very much to Sandy for coming along and, and, and talking about the benefits of membership of our trust and also the benefits of being a governor as well. Again, details of membership and governors is available on our website. Um, so please do look at that, www.uhd.nhs.uk. Um, but ultimately, a huge, huge, huge thank you to Stephen. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I learned a lot. I wish I'd known a lot earlier. My children are now a bit older. Um, I wish I'd known a lot of that beforehand. Um, but thank you to him and, and, and thank you all again very much for coming. Goodbye.